Good morning and greetings and blessings to you wherever you are in the world today. Good morning to guests and good morning to friends. I'm grateful we can gather together even though we're not face to face. Even this effort demonstrates that we're Jesus' people together, Jesus' people together in a changing world. Many of us have developed new habits this week. We're probably washing our hands while singing happy birthday twice. We're staying inside more than we would want to. Or maybe not. We're maintaining more physical distance, one to two meters between one another. But with change and unknown things, I have most craved confidence in where my foundations are. I've craved confidence in in my hope and and looking for where stability comes from. In the face of instability, I look for foundations. The best foundations I've found are Jesus Christ, my Lord, one another in the family of faith, so many of all of you, and the book of Psalms that teaches me and teaches all of us how to pray how to discern and find our foundations in uncertain times. This morning, we gather together in a new way, but I lean completely on these old ancient foundations, the promise of God's presence with me and with you right where you are. Jesus himself as our foundation, our hope, and our example that the Lord saves. And the gift of guidance to listen and to speak with God as we learn to pray the Psalms or continue to practice praying the Psalms. In Psalm 91, sorry, in Psalm 61, the psalmist says, God, listen to my cry. Pay attention to my prayer. When my heart is weak, I cry out to you from the very ends of the earth. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I am because you have been my refuge, a tower of strength in the face of my enemy. And in Psalm 46, the Lord is our refuge and strength, a help in near, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea, when its waters roar and rage and the mountains shake because of its surging waves. This morning, I plan to continue to teach about Jesus' temptation in the desert as part of Lent. But over and over, I found myself drawn into the Psalms and in then into the story of Jesus and his scared disciples. Whether you feel uncomfortable today, uncertain or unsure or afraid, these are the things the disciples all felt as they physically stood with the creator of heaven and earth. Jesus himself. This is the story of the storm in Matthew 8, verses 30, verses 23 to 27. The story goes like this. Jesus and his disciples had recently left a teaching time on the mountainside, and he'd proclaimed that, that he, his kingdom was coming into earth, and he taught what his kingdom is like, how it's different from the kingdoms of the world. Then he went on to demonstrate his real spiritual power what his kingdom actually looks like embodied. He healed a man with a skin disease. He healed a powerful Roman soldier's servant. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then more people came, bringing, bringing people who are spiritually afflicted and physically broken. Then after inviting more people to follow him, Jesus got in a boat with his disciples and he was tired and he fell asleep. This is what Matthew says, reading from Matthew 8. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A huge storm arose on the lake so that the waves were smashing over the boat. But Jesus was asleep. Like I said, he must have been tired. So they came to him saying, Lord, rescue us. We're going to drown. He said to them, why are you afraid, you people of weak faith? Then he got up and he gave orders to the winds and to the lake. And then there was a great calm. And the people were amazed and said, what kind of person is this? Even the winds and the lake obey him. Now, there are some important 
symbols in this passage that will help you understand the, the conviction and the message that, that, that I really think God has put in here for us. First, after Jesus' ministry and miracle time, where the Holy Spirit brought healing to all kinds of people, Jesus takes a break. He gets away to rest. That's a healthy thing to do. It's okay to feel tired and to just want to sleep. Jesus did. Second, water and waves in this passage, symbolically, well, water and waves and storms and nature in the ancient world are often understood as active forces working against people. Many ancient people believed that the waters were the source of chaos in the world. So stories where Jesus is walking on water or he's, he's calming the storm in this situation aren't merely natural miracles, as if a miracle could be natural, but they're also demonstrations of God's goodness and his power. The creator conquering evil and fear. This is why the disciples' question at the end of the passage is so significant. What kind of person is this? Even the wind and the lake obey him. Even evil and parts of creation obey this man who we think was sent by God. They're still wrestling with their own uncertainty. Is Jesus the one God sent to save the world from sin and from evil? To save Israel? To save the world from death? Is Jesus the creator of all? This is the question. And thirdly, in this passage, I think Jesus is tired and he hoped that after all the things his disciples saw that he'd done, they would trust in the face of evil and fear from the waters that he would care for them. But in that time, like in ours, when many people are afraid, I believe Jesus' question, why are you afraid, you people of weak faith, isn't a rebuke. When Jesus asks them, when he says, why are you afraid, you people of weak faith? He's not rebuking them or or, or being mad at them. I believe instead, he was hoping they had seen him for who he truly was. He is the one who came to save them. He is the one who came to sustain them and to give them everlasting hope and salvation and eternal life. Physically in the world and into eternity and new creation. but they didn't see it. Now, I imagine you can see some reasons why I would feel so pulled to this passage. Why do I trust that this passage is from God for us today? Why do I trust that this passage is what reminds me of my foundations? Jesus, the rock in stormy times. How does it connect with who we are and what we're doing? Well, first, After Jesus endured his temptation in the desert and then defeated evil and then went off into ministry, he went out to confront sin and evil and death. Then here, Jesus is tired from ministry as he gets in the boat and he allows his disciples to be stretched. Remember, the disciples walked with Jesus for three years, but they did not mature in that time into people of deep faith who believed everything Jesus had shown them. They needed to receive reminders constantly. And more importantly, they needed to receive the same Holy Spirit that we have, that we receive, that you can have if you ask. The Holy Spirit empowered them and reminded them of God's presence, of God's love working in them, in the whole world, despite their fear. This time on the boat stretched the disciples as many other times would stretch them during their time with Jesus and after his resurrection. They fell into looking to Jesus for a miracle to save them. And even though Jesus was disappointed in their fear, he showed them his power and he showed them his action. In our time, you and I will be stretched just like these disciples were stretched. For most of the Gospels, these disciples didn't understand Jesus' presence. They didn't understand the power he was working under. But they were stretched, and in the end of their lives, 11 of the 12 disciples died testifying 
faithfully to their trust in Jesus as their Lord to the end. And in these stretching times, we are also stretched. We are also deepened in our foundations as we search for answers and seek God's face. Do not be afraid. Jesus was their rock. Jesus is our rock. Now, connected to this, I see and hear people talking today that maybe the coronavirus is a test from God or a form of discipline. I don't believe this is true at all. When my children have done something I don't want them to, or they shouldn't because it's unhealthy, and I discipline them, it's because I want to teach them. I want to correct their path and show them the way. They know why they're being disciplined, and the discipline is connected to correcting what they've done. In the same way, God doesn't discipline without explaining, without showing what has happened and what his correction is. He doesn't just punish the world or his children and then say, you figure out what's wrong. See if you can figure it out. No. It's not discipline from the Lord because he hasn't shown us why this would have happened. Now, even though this coronavirus is not good, good can come out of it. This coronavirus has shown us that we live with the illusion over control over our lives. This is a luxury, this kind of control that we've only known for a short short while. Or the wealthy of the world have known for longer. Some of us have learned to ignore the creator and the spiritual realm for a while and live fruitful in our wealth. Many of us think we hold the keys to life when the only one who really ever held the keys is our good Lord and our Savior. The one who holds the keys now is our Lord and Savior who sits on the throne holding them in his hands. The one who already defeated sin, who already defeated death. The one who already defeated the evil powers, who already went down into death for three days and then was filled with resurrection life and came back. Resurrection life from God. This is divine energy here and now, resurrection life. Confidence that we're God's children. Holy hope. I borrow a prayer from the psalmist that resurrection life that we've received will allow us to run and not grow weary or walk and not grow faint. Because our Lord was crucified as king. He was captured by death, but then he destroyed death from the inside. And he came back parading through the streets, filled with eternal life in bodily form. As Jesus calmed the storm and was Lord over creation, and as we testify, our foundations are Jesus Christ himself, who holds the world together as the only one in history who's defeated death ultimately. I want to offer you one last image. In our global context, I want you to take this image and hold it in your mind, hold it in your heart, hold it in your physical body and your, and your spirit. Meditate on it. If Jesus came into our time today to conquer sin and death as a human person, I think he would get the coronavirus himself, willingly. It would develop inside him and bring him to the emergency room. Then it would bring him into intensive care. Then he would stop breathing and it would all be over. The creator would be defeated by a part of his creation. But while he laid cold in the morgue, the creating and the healing life of the Holy Spirit that can never be held down, continued to produce antibodies and they recreate him new and healed. 
Then Jesus, his life and his body would return. His body, his mind, his spirit would stand up and return from the grave. Resurrection life. And not only return, but return with the cure to coronavirus. Coursing through his veins to share with the world as the antidote to sin and to sickness and death. The virus itself turned into the healing. That, brothers and sisters, is a picture of our Savior and his Lordship. The Lord we follow with all of our being. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the beautiful irony that we carry, that I call each of you to hold in your minds and your spirits, is that the word corona is Latin for crown. In the same way that the gospel writers tell us the story that Jesus was wrapped in a purple robe, just like a king, that he hung on a cross like a throne, that he had a crown of thorns on his head. Today, Jesus Christ, our King of kings and Lord of lords over all creation, has a different kind of crown. He has put on the coronavirus as a crown, and he has defeated the fear that it causes Jesus wears the crown over all creation for all eternity. And that is what the resurrection declares to fear. Declares to death. And has declared for 2,000 years. Everyone who meets Jesus face to face, like the Apostle Paul, for example, looks in the face of persecution and sickness and death and hears the Spirit. And as the Apostle Paul said, Where, O death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Today, we celebrate Sunday worship on day seven of the week. A good day, a rest day, a day of wholeness and shalom, a day of resurrection life from God, a gift. We turn our hearts to God and we celebrate his resurrection from the dead on Sunday. When we worship, we celebrate his lordship over creation and we celebrate his lordship over every storm. Today, I commend you to hold these foundations in your being as we are together. Remind your family and tell your friends how you've learned not to be afraid, even when the foundations of the world seem to shake, that your Lord is present with you. Because you know the one who wears the true corona, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who Isaiah reminds us shall reign forever and ever. So today, if you are afraid or just uncertain, take these practical steps. Wash your hands. Clean your counters. Don't touch your face. Because this virus doesn't have wings, as one scientist put it. It needs to travel into your lungs through your mouth or or be breathed in. And these steps give us control to show the virus that it doesn't get access to our bodies. And so with wisdom, we take action. Washing our hands, not touching our face, wiping things down. And then take these steps eternally for your spirit. Remember who your Lord is. The one who calms the storm that attacked his disciples, even when they didn't trust him. The one who lives, even though he died. This morning, I believe Jesus looks at you and says the same words that he said to Mary and Martha when they were afraid for their friend Lazarus. Jesus looked at them and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. Every one of Jesus' disciples have passed away until now. 
Right now, Jesus is still the only one who is raised from the dead and will live eternally. But Jesus himself is the resurrection. And he demonstrates and embodies the resurrection that we hold our hope on. The crown, the corona that he wears, is the demonstration that he is Lord and King over all creation. Every time you think of or you sit with or you hear the word COVID-19 or Corona, remember the broken crown of thorns that Jesus wore in death and the royal crown he now wears in resurrection for all eternity. Jesus looks to you and he says, Do not be afraid. Remember. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, trusts in me, will live even though they die. Thank you, brothers and sisters, with the love of Christ. Let's pray. Father, Holy Spirit and Lord Jesus, We come together in a strange way over the computer. But we trust you and we love you. Those who are uncertain or lonely or unsure or we're all experiencing separation. We lift one another up. We ask that you would help us to get over our fear. Fear to call one another and be in touch in a way that isn't natural, that we haven't practiced in the past. Fear of what the next day might hold. Fear of not knowing how we might get groceries, if that's the issue. We ask that you would empower your body to see how you are moving in your world. To be your faithful people in life and healing and in death and in faithfulness. Because ultimately you are Lord and you are wise and we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.